Hello, I'm Kyle with DIY Auto Homeschool and this is our basic alignment angles video. In this video we're going to discuss the basic, the three basic alignment angles that most often will be adjusted during a typical alignment. That's caster, camber, and toe. Now, these are your own, only your three basic angles. There are a couple other angles that are included in suspension and steering geometry that we'll discuss in a video to follow this. But today, these are your basic alignment angles. We're just going to talk about what they are and just a few little pieces of information about them. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a really good understanding of the three basic alignment angles that you're going to hear about if you have to align a vehicle or if you have to take your vehicle to get aligned. So I'll get this board switched up to put the first, uh, the first angle we're going to talk about up here and uh, we'll be right back with that. Okay, the first angle we're going to talk about in this video is going to be caster. Now, caster is harder for some people to visualize because it's not a noticeable movement of the wheel, it's a tilt of the steering axis. So, let's look at what the definition of caster is. The definition of caster is the angle of the steering axis of a vehicle when viewed from the side and compared to a vertical line drawn through the center line of the wheel. Now the last bit of being the vertical line being through the center line of the wheel, that's just my personal preference on when I draw it. I prefer to put the line right through the center of the wheel. I just think it makes it easier to look at and understand. Uh, that's not part of the actual definition. A vertical line there or here or here is going to be a vertical line and the angle between the steering axis and that line is never going to change. So the last bit, that's just me so that's not the actual definition so long as you get that it's the side view uh, of the steering axis angle compared to a vertical line that's what caster is now our steering axis we get this line by drawing through the upper and lower steering pivots our upper steering pivots are typically going to be ball joints or upper strut mounts and our low lower steering pivots are almost always going to be ball joints. Uh, you may run into a couple situations where there's something different or it's not exactly on a ball joint but we'll discuss those in another video when we look at uh, some of the other types of suspension and the way ball joints are used on the knuckles. Uh, steering knuckles in vehicles. So, but for the most part, most part, your lower steering axis is just going to be a lower ball joint. Um, now, caster is measured positive and negative when the top of the tire is tilted back, or the top of the steering axis is tilted back. That's positive caster, and when it's leaned forward towards the front of the vehicle, that's negative caster. Positive caster helps with steering stability uh, and helps give a self-centering effect to the steering geometry, meaning that it will want to stay in a straight line when you're driving down the highway and you let go of the wheel, which you should never do. But letting go of the wheel, you'll see that it will want to stay in a straight line if your caster is higher, it has a higher positive caster and it's set right. Um, the common specs you'll see on automotive applications are 3 to 7 degrees, which that in and of itself makes it difficult to really register what caster is. Even if you look at suspension and you see the upper steering pivot and the lower steering pivot, you're like, well, that doesn't really look like it's tilted any way at all because 3 to 7 degrees is not that much. Uh, in fact, if we were to draw it on this diagram, I believe three to seven degrees would be somewhere probably about right there. It'd be very hard to distinguish, which is one of the reasons we exaggerate on these diagrams so much just to give a better understanding of what caster is. Now somewhere where we do not have to exaggerate is on motorcycles. If you look at a motorcycle, and forgive my, uh, my drawing here, it's not the best. This is the front wheel, obviously. But up here, you have your upper and lower steering pivots, and this shows us what our caster angle is, and this looks like it's a 30 to 40 degree caster angle, which is not uncommon on motorcycles. Uh, and when you've got only one wheel on the front of a vehicle, that's what helps it with its directional stability, meaning that when you've got a rider on there and it's weighing down the back side, uh, behind this, these steering pivot points, it's really going to make that wheel want to stay in a straight line because that's where the weight on the vehicle is keeping it. And it's just the same with caster here, only 
on automotive applications, steering axis inclina inclination also comes into play, and we'll discuss that in the next video to follow up this one. But caster right now, looking at it, more positive caster will give you better steering stability because it will want to follow just in a straight line. The more negative your caster goes, the more likely your vehicle is going to follow all the little dips in the road and the ruts in the road created by tires driving over it hundreds of thousands of times over and over. Uh, so that's what we kind of want to avoid. It, so we kick higher caster into there and it helps us keep vehicles driving in a straight line uh, with minimal input from the driver. Uh, and like I said, inversely more negative caster creates uh, sensitivity in steering, especially at high speeds. Uh, most often, caster is the first angle to be adjusted. On any given axle, the, uh, whether it's the front axle or the rear axle or the rear axle, the method in which you adjust uh, the angles is going to be, the order is going to be caster, camber, toe. Now, on the rear of vehicles, caster is almost never there. I can't say I've ever come across a, a vehicle that had a caster adjustment on the rear. Even some of the vehicles that have come out with rear wheel steering, I've never seen any kind of caster adjustment. That's not to say that I just, I've never experienced it and I've never seen it and it's there. I've just, I've never come across a situation where you'll have it and 99% of the time, there's never gonna be any caster adjustment on the rear. So, caster is also not considered to be a tire wear angle. However, there is one situation in which it could be a tire wear angle. When you look at something like a motorcycle, if a car were to have that much caster or excessively high caster compared to what it's supposed to have, whenever you turn that wheel, it's going to be rocking the tires up on the side and that can cause excessive wear on the inside or outside shoulder of the tire which could mean with excessive caster you could get inside or outside shoulder wear on the tire. Uh, it's not common. I can't say I've ever seen a situation where I could definitely attribute shoulder, uh, inside and outside shoulder wear on the tire to extreme caster problems. Uh, but it's something there, something to be noted that it's a possibility. Next in our uh, Next in our series, we're going to be moving on and discussing, uh, discussing camber. So we'll get the board switched over to camber and we'll get set up for that. Okay, we got our board switched over to camber now. So let's look at this right off the bat. We can see camber is much easier to visualize than caster was. That's what I'm talking about because camber is an actual movement of the wheel. Uh, in this case, the tilted in or tilted out. So it's much easier to see and it's much easier to visualize. Uh, so looking at camber, we've got our definition. It is the inward or outward tilt of the wheel when viewed from the front and compared to a vertical line. In this case, well in any case, if you have the top of the wheel tilted inward towards the vehicle, it is negative camber. And if it's tilted outward away from the vehicle, it's going to be positive camber. Now. With this style that's drawn here and with any suspension, you're going to see camber changes with suspension, jounce, and rebound. And jounce and rebound simply means a compression and extension of the suspension. As you drive down the road and the suspension moves up and down to deal with the road surface and bumps and dips and potholes and everything, you're going to see camber changes. It's going to constantly be changing. But most always it's going to sit right where it's been engineered to sit and it's usually very very close to zero or at zero. Now oftentimes the way the suspension is set up it will not camber readings will not be the same while you're driving down the road as they are when you're sitting still and so they're engineered to be right where they want them when you're driving down the road and not always when you're just sitting still. So Camber measurements, you're typically going to see less than one degree of camber, either positive or negative. Uh, you will find some vehicles that are positive camber, some vehicles that are negative camber, and it's all based on how they've designed the suspension to deal with the, the road, uh, with different movements on the road, bumps, potholes, everything, just running down the road at all. How that suspension is going to sit when the vehicle is in operating speed going down the road that's how they have to consider this stuff. So sometimes 
like I said, sitting at a you know stop even when it's put on the alignment machine. We may set the specs to exactly what they want, but they put them there because if they're at that point, they're going to ride exactly right when they're going down the road. And that's the goal, is to get these vehicles to run down the road with no excessive tire wear and no pulling problems. But, uh, kind of got off on a little tangent there about it, but the thing to know is camber will change with suspension movement. Now, as I touched on a little, it's often designed into the vehicle to accommodate for factors like road crown and anticipated passenger weight, vehicle weight, all that. And these are set actually so precisely that when you do an alignment there's often very strict specifications such as you're supposed to align this vehicle with a full tank of fuel or with half a tank of fuel and a hundred pound weight in the trunk and a hundred and fifty pound weight in the driver's seat area because they are anticipating those loads and those strains averagely on the vehicle while it's driving down the road. Now you can't always meet these requirements but that's a basic overview of what camber is and as I said it's very easy to to see camber just looking at it so uh, the last alignment angle we're going to cover is going to be toe. So we'll get the board switched over to toe, and we'll be back in just a second to talk about it. Okay, we got our board switched over, so let's look at toe. Um, looking at the definition of toe, it is the distance comparison between the leading and trailing edge of the tires. Now, the simple explanation is a lot more, well, simple than the definition. If the front of your tires are facing in, you've got toe in. If they're facing out, you've got toe out. These are some exaggerated examples just to give you an idea of what direction uh, the tires are going to face for toe in and toe out. Now, toe, more so than any other alignment angle, is a critical tire wear angle. And it can just destroy your tires very quickly if it's out by a whole lot. In fact, I have seen people who've replaced their own suspension components, tie rod ends or even ball joints and they don't get everything back together just right or there's enough of a change to tow when they put it all back together that driving 20 miles to get an alignment has just ruined their tires. Now these are like worst case scenarios but it has happened and it can happen. So when you're doing your own work and you're replacing your own uh, suspension and steering components uh, you need to be mindful of what your toe settings are doing and in a future video here before too long we'll talk about how you can get your toe set at least close enough to get it to an alignment shop without worrying about scrubbing the tires off so the other thing to bear in mind with toe is that toe will change with vehicle speed the faster the, uh, the tires roll down the road, the friction forces of the tires hitting the road are going to want to straighten it up and push the tires to zero toe, just running straight ahead. They're, it's always going to try to do that. So if your toe is significantly off, that's how you'll get it to scrub the tires because it'll be trying to force the tires one way, the tires will be stuck facing another way, and it just destroys the rubber on the tires. But at the same time, uh, at the same time, the aerodynamic forces on the vehicle, the wind blowing over the vehicle is going to push it down and lower the ride height or change the ride height and that will cause toe and camber problems or changes, not problems but changes just as we talked about when we looked at camber. So just like camber, toe is designed to be just where they want it at zero toe at highway speeds. It will not always be at zero toe when you're sitting on the ground, and most often it's actually not. Uh, and toe, even though it's given in measurements, and many of the specs you get will be in sixteenths of an inch or thirty seconds of an inch, on an alignment machine it will often be given in degrees, uh, just the degree that it's facing. But the spec will also be translated into degrees on the alignment machine so you can very easily adjusted. You don't have to convert anything. Uh, and toe more so than anything else will cause the off-center steering wheel that people 
typically complain about when they come in and say my steering wheel is off to one side uh, if it's off significantly like really bad you'll most likely run into some kind of bent you know steering or suspension component either a tie rod or a tie rod end is bent or a control arm is bent and it's actually not uncommon to run into that so if you're looking at doing your own work pay very close attention to what the components look like from one side of the vehicle to the other look for bent components because all of that's going to cause a problem when you go to get the vehicle aligned if you replace your own suspension components and then you take it to a shop the last thing you want to hear is that you missed something uh, and you're gonna have to either take it back and replace something else and then bring it back to the shop again or you're gonna pay them to replace it either way uh, so that is, in a nutshell, that's the basic overview of all of the alignment angles. Uh, following up with this video, or following this video, we'll have a, a video that goes more into detail, uh, one video that goes more into detail on more alignment angles that are not directly adjustable, but really come into the engineered uh, suspension and steering geometry of the vehicle and we'll also go into a video that talks about how you adjust all these alignment angles on different kind of kinds of vehicles so that if you're wanting to do this if you work in a shop and you're wanting to get the chance to do an alignment we'll talk about what you're going to be doing to adjust these or maybe you do alignments and you just want to get a little bit better get a little better understanding of how the angles work and what you're going to be doing to adjust them we'll cover all of that in the next two videos so stay tuned and we'll see you there